All right, buddy, let's get right after it. It is Mikey Likes You, the greatest health and fitness podcast in the world. And it's time for a little bit of that Q&A action. These are my favorite type of podcasts because I get to interact with people and that's what I love to do. That's what really gets me going. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I like to interview the guests. I really do. And, you know, it's it's always a pleasure because I get to handpick the guests now. It's not like, you know, in the old radio days where I had to just deal with a bunch of sometimes people I didn't want necessarily talk to. But, uh, you know, I, I I love this kind of open network This of, hey, ask me anything. I'll, I'll get back to you to the best of my abilities. Um, and that's what these Q&As are all about. Please like, subscribe. If you're watching this on YouTube, help me out. Um, spread the word. Like, subscribe. Hit that little bell thingy and uh, get updates whenever I release new videos. Now that I'm really settled in here in Texas, my new home, I'm going to be putting up a lot more content. I promise you. And... Um, my Patreon is available. I do have a lot of top tier um, accounts left, uh, little slots left. And I encourage you to go and, and give it a shot because I will tell you, you know, me firsthand, I know, I feel like I know a lot about health and fitness, getting in shape, monitoring my nutrition, understanding what's good for me and what's not. Um, as far as eating goes, healthy habits, all that stuff. And I still am constantly, at least a couple times a year, looking for other people that I can work with so that I can have that accountability. There's something really, really useful when you're trying to develop your ability in anything. Um, I've told this story a thousand times, and uh, I don't mind telling it again, because it was something that really impacted me. But... um, the radio show that I used to work for, Kevin and Bean Morning Show, one of the greatest morning shows in the history of the medium. Um, we were doing what we called a breakfast with. And they used to do breakfast with, and you name the band. And I mean everyone. We had Jack White, The White Stripes. We had U2, Coldplay, Metallica, uh, gosh, some Foo Fighters, just Linkin Park. All the, And what we do is, you know, it'd be a live show. With the band, they perform a couple songs and then also do interview clips. And you're there for four or five hours early in the morning. And it was this really intimate setup with all these different, amazing, really famous bands. Well, the Metallica one, um, I was sitting next to Kurt Kamet. That's where the setup was. There was like a stage where Kevin and Bean and Ralph and uh, everyone. And then I was at the end of it. And Kurt Kamet was the, the, the musical performance stage kind of made an L and was starting where I was sitting, where the broadcast stage was. So uh, in between, you know, commercial breaks and all that, where there was downtime, I would just be talking to him, trying my best not to bug and not to be a, a fanboy, but also taking this opportunity to talk to Kirk Hammett. And we were shooting the shit and he goes, yeah, well, I uh, before the tour starts, like, I'm, I'm going to fly back to um, San Francisco and drive home because I, 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 uh, I have my, my studies to get to. I'm like, oh, you like studying a language? Do you go back to college? And he's like, no, 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 guitar. I'm like, you fucking, you take guitar lessons? This is death magnetic era. This is what, 2010. I mean, he's already got like a 30-year career of selling 40 million records, and he's Kirk Hammett. And he says, yeah, I mean, I'm always trying to learn. You can always get better. And there's something about the accountability, too, of me having to go and, and perform in front of another guy and, and make sure that I'm keeping up with my, my skills and stuff. And that was just, it's a long story to tell you that there's a lot of value, even if you are fit, even if you know what you're doing, um, there's a lot of value into having that accountability to work with someone and have them go over your workouts, go over what you're eating, give you their advice. And then it's, it's this kind of living, breathing thing. And I do it. I work with other people. I've worked with uh, my friend Josiah Novak, Stan Efferding, um, Artemis Dolgan, um, over, over time, many different people. Uh, I'm sorry for those that I'm forgetting. Um, and it's always been incredibly useful. Oh, and my, of course, really my most important uh, figure in my career of active bodybuilding and also just in health and fitness in general, Alessandro Comadina, 
who's an Italian national um, IFBB pro bodybuilder. He's a fucking wizard. And I have him to thank for so much of even me being as passionate about nutrition and, and fitness as I am. So long winded way of saying like I do have uh, slots open at my top tier where I, I am yours to personally train you and be there and, and answer all your questions and help you kind of customize your eating and your training so that it better suits you. Because that's really the key to all this is that the answer to almost every question in fitness and health is maybe. Maybe that's the right thing. It's Maybe it's good for you, but it might not be necessarily over. There's no royal yes and no when it comes to a lot of things with nutrition and fitness. So uh, Patreon, Mike Catherwood, look for it. Sign up if you like. Also, don't necessarily, you don't have to work with me. There's there's a, men, a million other people out there that are really accountable. Uh, my, my last guest, Funk Roberts, what an amazing guy and the type of guy you want to work with, the type of guy you want to give your money to. So uh, check it out if you're, if you're in need. All right, let's get to it. Let's go to them questions. Yay, yay. Uh, all right. Uh, Vol, 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 Vox Electra, Vox Electra 99. Do you eat pineapple? Yeah. Yeah. Um, almost all of my carbohydrate intake comes from fruit, and pineapple is definitely one of the better ones. Not only is it a great source of fructose, which most fruit is, fructose being the sugar uh, that fruit provides, um, lactose being dairy sugar, you know, fructose, sucrose is kind of table sugar, um, dextrose, you know, anything with O's is a sugar. Um, and, uh, I, I, almost all my, my carbohydrate intake is from fruit. Pineapple is definitely at the top of the list because not only is it really well digested, but it actually has bromelain in it, which aids in the digestion of everything else that you eat. Um, pineapple, mango are two of the fruits that I will eat by themselves. Most everything else I try to have a source of protein with it, but, uh, I do eat, um, I do eat that pineapple. Colts, coltish vibes. Should you grease the groove throughout the day, even though you're training regularly? Yes and no. Yes, you should grease the groove. What that means is, is to do really high volume, really high frequency training of a single movement. Um, Pavel Tsatsalin is the guy who kind of developed that or at least brought it to the Western world. And um, you you grease the groove. He came up with that term too. Um, it's most commonly used with a single exercise that isn't going to harm or reduce your ability to recover from everything else. You wouldn't grease the groove with deadlifts. You wouldn't grease the groove with squats. You would grease the groove with, say, chin-ups. That's my favorite thing to do is to grease the groove because I do think that because chin-ups and pull-ups are so incredibly difficult, even if you're strong, um, that the best way to go about training them is not necessarily kind of a linear progressive overload. It's to train them a lot at a suboptimal intensity. So I will prescribe for people if they're really interested in getting good at chin-ups and pull-ups, which you should be, um, go ahead and do five sets a day. And if you can only do three, start off with one. Five times a day, you do one chin-up, okay, at different intervals. Then a week later, you start doing two, five times a day. It's a high frequency throughout the day, consistent movement of the single prescribed movement. Um, after the next week, you do three, five times a day. So you know what I'm saying? So it's not something that's going to tax you greatly. And it should be something that isn't going to hinder your recovery. So again, things that are so systemically damaging, like deadlifts, squats, um, some any type of like conditioning movements, I wouldn't want to do that frequently, but, uh, chin-ups were great. Pull-ups were great. Um, push-ups were great. Uh, and you also have to decide what it is you you're focusing on. If, if you're particularly weak in vertical pulling, that's the time to grease the groove with the chin-up or pull-up on top of your normal training. So yes, you should grease the groove on top of your normal training, but only if you're trying to specialize in something and that thing that you're specializing in isn't going to impede your ability to train all other body parts. What toothpaste do you use? I don't know. Uh, I use the toothpaste that my wife gets. Could be anything. 
My wife is a big believer in kind of homeopathic, naturopathic stuff. She definitely doesn't like normal store-bought toothpastes because apparently they got uh, harmful gunk in them. I don't give a fuck. I'm not saying she's wrong. I just, it's it's never taken up space in my mind. So I use whatever my wife gets. We just got a new one and it's fucking awesome. Hold on. Gorganics, George Gannics. There you go. And these are, as you can tell, they're fucking pills. I know, weird, right? They're little pills that you take and you pop them in your mouth and they kind of start to dissolve as the saliva gets to them. And then you use your toothbrush to mix them around, but they're charcoal toothpaste tablets. Natural effervescent cleansing tablets with cream of tartar and kitten clay. Again, I like hippie shit, but they're great. I love them. So there you go. That's that's the toothpaste I use. I'm assuming you're asking because you think I got nice teeth. So thank you. Uh, is it possible to gain weight muscle if you're not consistently in a cal- calorie surplus, but you use some Mexican supplements? Yes. Now, for those of you who are not familiar, Mexican supplements means anabolic steroids. That's one of the main reasons why they are so effective. Anabolics, uh, in particular, as opposed to the androgens, which are just naturally occurring hormones, you know, the the testosterone, um, pregnenolone, things like that. Um, the anabolics, the DECA, Winstrol, and Anadrol, that kind of stuff, trend, they so greatly increased your protein synthesis that you can be in either maintenance or caloric deficit. If your protein's high enough, you can be in a slight deficit and still gain muscle with the use of anabolics. Okay, that is a, uh, of, I need to make that caveat. Um, and this guy, uh, Aaron Price, 13, you're the one talking about the Mexican supplements. Yeah, that 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 is a huge advantage. And also, that's one of the things that I encourage people who are going to use gear, who are going to use Um, supplements, uh, Mexican supplements. Take advantage of the fact that you're using them. One of the biggest mistakes I see with people who are going to use gear is that they, one of the things that motivates them to use steroids is the fact that they want to get fucking massive and they want to get massive quick. The problem with that is that you're already going to retain so much more water by using an anabolic and an androgenic compound that then you start getting into this thousand plus calorie surplus and you do gain weight, crazy amounts of weight, but it's like 10% muscle. And then you spend the rest of your life as an offensive lineman trying to be a bodybuilder and you, you fuck the whole thing. Take advantage of the fact that your protein synthesis and your mTOR and everything is so much elevated in comparison to the natural athlete and eat. Uh, a very controlled diet in a very, very, very small surplus or frankly, eat in a fucking deficit and take advantage of the fact that you can gain some actual muscle mass while you're losing body fat. You know, people don't make the mistake of trying to think that you can amplify the effects of, of gear when in actuality, you're deteriorating from their overall effects by just eating like a fucking pig. And you can listen to all the fucking bodybuilders you want. You can listen to all the meatheads at the gym. The people that are going to tell you, you got to fucking go, you got to eat big to get big and all that, all uh, bullshit. They're all fat. I'll bet you any, I'll bet you dollars to donuts. All the dudes online, all the fucking keyboard tough guys, all the fucking dudes at the gym that are going to constantly encourage you to just eat more, 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 more. Ad nauseum. They're fat fucks. Yeah, they may be strong. They may be, have lots of muscle, but they're fat. And that fucking defeats the entire purpose of doing any of this. Unless you want to be a competitive power lifter, which I don't think most people want to do. If you want to have a physique that is beautiful, and I think that that's the motivation for so many people, especially non-competitive athletes, to use gear, to go down that road of using anabolic androgenic steroids, take advantage of them as best you can. And one of the main ways you can fuck things up is to just eat too much in, a, in, a, in, in this race to be huge. 
Because in your race to be huge, you will get huge and you will get fat. Take advantage of the fact that you are in a better setup to gain muscle mass without the necessary excess cal cal caloric intake and either eat at maintenance or, or in a slight deficit. Lose a little body fat and jack up a little bit. You're, you're, you're putting your body recomposition abilities in hyperdrive, so go for it. Unless you're just married to the idea of being a monster, and then if, if that's your goal, then do it. Uh, let's see here. Trey thinks, what's the difference between branch chain amino acids and essential amino acids? Great question. Branch chain amino acids are very popular and they've been long looked at as like this gold standard for gaining muscle or retaining muscle while you're trying to lose body fat. They are three amino acids. The branch chain amino acids are leucine, isoleucine, and valine. And I'm not here to say that they're worthless, but essential amino acids are nine essential amino acids. They are the essential amino acids that your body needs for protein synthesis. <laughs> protein synthesis. Doesn't roll off the tongue. So if you can, there is ample and conclusive scientific proof to show that essential amino acids are much more effective at protein synthesis for hypertrophy, for gaining muscle, and for retention of muscle mass when in a caloric deficit. Um, I think that essential amino acids are one of the best supplements you can invest in. They are energy precursors. Again, they are anti-catabolic and very anabolic, and they are incredibly useful. I will say this. A good essential amino acid product is very expensive. In comparison, especially to branch chain amino acids, which you can now get relatively inexpensive, uh, inexpensively, an essential amino acid product is good and it is useful. It is also pricey. And essential amino acids are like tattoos and sushi for me. You don't want to get shitty ones. If you're going to spend the money, if you're going to do it, do it right. Save up and get the best. You want to get pharmaceutical grade, high quality essential amino acids. I really stand by Ben Greenfield's stuff. Ben Greenfield's fucking crazy. He puts stem cells in his dick. But you know what Ben Greenfield knows? He knows quality when it comes to products. And his key on stuff, uh, they make a great essential amino acid on top of um, a lot of other great products. So I, I encourage you to look into the Keon Essential Amino Acids by Ben Greenfield. Also, MPA Supplements use, makes a, um, a great essential amino acid product with 13 grams of essential amino acids along with some electrolytes and sea salt to help you um, stay hydrated and, and, and to help balance your, your um, what are those fuckers, uh, electrolytes when you're training. I love that product. Um, that is called their farm grade, farm grade EAA, pharmaceutical grade essential amino acids. So farm grade by MPA, MPA and Keon essential amino acids. Those are the two that I would definitely recommend um, if you're going to do it. And I say if you're going to, if you only have the money for branch chain amino acids, just eat better, have that protein in your system. It, it's going to, it's going to weigh out in the end. Don't waste your money. If you do have the extra cash, go ahead and make that investment into EAAs, especially if you like to train fasted. Um, I don't, I'm not a big proponent of fasted training, but a lot of people, myself included, just can't eat early in the morning, which is when I like to train a lot of times. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll take a couple scoops or, or a handful of pills of essential amino acids on my way to train, and that will at least keep me in an anti-catabolic state um, and, uh, it allows me to train in a, in a more comfortable way. Cause I, like a lot of people, I don't like to train with a full belly. I just, I feel weird and lethargic. Um, let's see. Wonderful toy. Your top tips for keeping your pecker up when you are sick, injured, and you can't train. I'm not sure I understand the question. Are you talking literally about keeping an erection? Um, because you, you also say when you're sick, injured, and can't train. I, if you mean ways to power through sickness or, or injury and train still, um, drink more water, definitely um, get more sleep, 
And I, I'm not a big fan. I think you should stay away from train either. My take on everything in life, not just training, is do it better, do it less. Have better, have less. Don't buy lots of Chinese-made fucking bullshit. Have a small collection of really artist, well-made artisan goods. When it comes to my clothing, that's why I, I buy only American-made clothing. Instead of having 20 H&M uh, denim jackets. I got my fucking rogue territory handmade in Los Angeles by real people of high quality Japanese denim. And I'll keep this forever. You know, I have, I have three pairs of red wing boots. I don't need 11 different boots to fit different needs. You know what I'm saying? Like, and my, my feeling on training is the same way. Don't constantly go to the gym just to say you did with mediocre effort Go there when you're capable of giving it your all so that every single time you go to your training facility, wherever it may be, you're going to be better than the last time. And if you're sick, if you're injured, if you've got crazy stress going on, if you uh, didn't sleep the night before, take a day off. I'd much rather see that. Train better, train less. I think that unnecessary volume is one of the biggest reasons why people don't make a lot of the gains that they're um, that they're in, intending to make. Uh, as far as keeping your pecker up, if that's what you're talking about, I don't have any advice, man. I'm sorry. I certainly have had my 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 woes with the bedroom. I've certainly failed, but I've never done the nope. I can get a boner. Any goddamn time. I've never had a problem with, including, I, I've been tweaking. I've been, I've been, I've had whiskey dick. And I still, boners are never a problem for me. So I'm the wrong guy to ask. I'm very sorry. I premature ejaculate. <laughs> I've had some really embarrassing moments. With that. I, I'm not going to sit here and say like, I'm Captain America in the bedroom, that I'm infallible. I have my problems. But uh, ED is not one of them. I'm I strong like bull in that territory, so I, I just would feel like I, I'm 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 the wrong guy to ask. There's got to be someone out there who's brave enough to be open about the fact that they've dealt with ED. Um, but you know, Cialis and, and Viagra they work, and a Blue Chew, proud sponsor of this company or this podcast. That's a great company, and they will deliver the active ingredients of Cialis or Viagra right to your door. You don't have to deal with any of the embarrassing stuff. Um. How important is, this is a great question from CSUF, is that Cal State University Fullerton? Go Fullerton, Titans, Titans, right? Cal State University Fullerton Blacksmith. How important is hitting your macros exactly? If you're a little under or over, should you nitpick your diet to get that exact number? No, not important at all. Um, in fact, the science shows if your calories are there and your protein level is there, the other two macronutrients don't matter for shit. Honest. That's what science shows. Um, and all the keto zealots or all the high carb, low fat guys, uh, plant it does it doesn't matter. In the end, it it doesn't matter. That was a shitty rock impression. But it doesn't matter. Uh, get your protein and keep your calories where they need to be. If you want to lose weight, obviously a slight deficit. If you want to gain weight, a slight surplus. You get that and you get your protein. Hitting your macros perfectly doesn't matter for shit. Um, obviously a slight, a slight, uh, uh, a slight leaning towards higher carb. If you're someone who's like a competitive athlete in an anaerobic, uh, you know, arena, um, if you're someone who's into endurance or if you're just, a, you know, an active kind of regular in your regular life, you're sedentary and then you're, you want to stay active and fit, you can hedge your bets a little bit more on fat and take down your carbohydrates a little bit. But to be honest, it, it, as long as your calories are there, it doesn't really matter. So just eat the things that you enjoy eating to get to your calories with a high enough protein content. And that's going to solve so many of your problems. Uh, how should a proper... Five by five program be structured. How many exercises, movements each day for each plane of movement from Stickmeister? 
Well, a proper five by five program should be set up based around the three power lifts, those being the bench press, the squat, and the deadlift. I like the three day a week training protocol. Um, and there's there's wiggle room with a lot of it. But you want to hit one of those three lifts every day. And you want to add in overhead press or some type of overhead uh, vertical pushing movement. And you want to add in some type of uh, vertical pulling movement. Uh, ch- weighted chins are my favorite or just chin ups if you're incapable. If you add in core work and a row, uh, some type of horizontal pulling, you know, dumbbell, barbell rows, you're good. So you got hinge, squat, vertical push, uh, horizontal push, horizontal pull, vertical pull. So there's a six. Deadlift Monday, bench press Wednesday, squat Friday. Okay, now you have the other three that you need to move in. Now those are the uh, those are the overhead pushing movement, the vertical push, vertical pull, and the horizontal pull. I like to do horizontal pull with my bench press. So I do bench press and rows. I do uh, squatting and overhead press. And I do deadlift and vertical pulling. Okay, so I do deadlifts and chins on Monday. I'll do bench press and rowing on Wednesday. And then I'll do squatting and overhead press on Friday. Okay. You have those two exercises each workout. Mixing core work. I like to mix in core work every time I train. And then you can decide how you want to add in maybe one other exercise, be it for arms or anything, but it's not necessary. It's not necessary. I think really committing and pushing yourself to linear progression in three exercises, a a training session is sufficient. You just got to train like a bulldog. Why are manholes round from the mind of a jester? Let me think. I'm assuming that manholes are round because they're heavy as fuck. And once the sewage worker or the sanitation worker gets his or her hands underneath it to get those fuckers up, I don't know if you've used some type of tool for mechanical advantage or if you just go at it like a G. Once you get them up, it's nice to be able to roll them. So you don't have to carry them because if they were square or hexagonal or uh, 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 triangular, you would have to uh, you would have to carry them. You couldn't roll them. You don't need a wheelbarrow or some type of dolly. You can just pull that thing up, put it on side, roll it. That is my assumption. Now, let me, since you brought up manholes, Berkeley for a while was like, that's, that's the patriarchy at work. It should be called person hole or man. No, manholes cover sewage and women holes are the most beautiful thing there is. Manholes are fucking gross. It's the we on, the only hole we have is our pee pee hole and our booty hole, and on men both are usually gross. So it's very appropriate that we call them manholes because they go over sewage. You don't want to associate the beautiful, pristine, cherubic woman hole, which is the giver of life. It's a canal of life. It's a tunnel where babies come, and at the end of that tunnel, life erupts. And if you're going in that way, it's amazing. Okay? That, I know that there's a lot of political, uh, there's there's some, 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 gravitas to discussing how we identify and title things right now, man, woman, whatnot. I'm telling you, nothing to do with patriarchy. We should leave that the manhole because the woman hole is too beautiful and cherished to associate with sewage. Thank you. 
How do you recommend sourcing quality meat? I've heard of online butchers, but I haven't tried any of them yet. I'm out in Irvine, California, and I haven't found too many butchers in the area to go talk to. Also, relatively new to the grill barbecuing game. So if you have any general tips, I'll take them. From Corvin Davenport. I do recommend online meat sourcing. Cutting out the middleman is always a great thing. It saves you money. But when it comes to your meats, you're, you're, you're making a huge, huge contribution to sustainable farming. Regenerative farming and sustainable farming is the way to the future. It's the way of the future. I am a big proponent of eating animal protein. But I am not someone who is blind to the atrocity that is how we get most of our meat. It's fucking crazy. I can't believe if aliens came down and looked at humans and they're like, okay, let's examine how these people behave. Factory farming would be one of those things where the aliens are like, what the fuck? Are, are you, you just you line them up and let them swim in their own shit and then you just torture them and let them. It sucks. It's not right. It is also not necessarily good for this environment here that we have on Earth. By the way, best planet by far in our solar system, at least. So if you're going to eat meat, which I think you should, if you have moral problems with that, I respect that. And I understand going that route, the vegan route, if you just uh, you don't have you ethically are against the idea. Good for you. I'm certainly not going to argue with you. Awesome. I admire it, actually. But if you uh, find the value of animal protein and the nutrition that it gives you, do your best to source it from the best places. And you can do that at an affordable, in an affordable way by going directly to these farms, which now sell online. And it's awesome. You buy in bulk. Meat is one of those things that it's not compromised if you freeze it. So buy a shit ton, save yourself some money, make the investment in lots of meat, the meat that you like, whether it be uh, fowl, poultry, um, fish, or, or, or red meat. And you get it in bulk and then you put it in your freezer and you have it at your, uh, your fingertips to use however you like. Um, and also I, I do think that a lot of these farms, you know, I, I get a lot of great range, um, or wild idea bison. I order a shit ton at a time. Because I love bison, I love it nutritionally, I love it, the taste of it, and I can use it in so many different ways. And I, it is expensive in comparison to just your average ground beef product that you can get at the supermarket. But when I order it in bulk from directly from Wild Idea uh, or a great range, um, those are the two that I, I, I like to frequent, I know that I'm giving back to something that's sustainable and actually regenerative to the earth and, it, and, and its natural form. We here in North America... Uh, for those of you that are watching or listening in North America, we should be eating buffalo and bison. Okay, that is very native to this to this area, and it is kind of the the staple natural animal for this this area. Having wild roaming bison and buffalo is helpful and regenerates the grass and the soil beneath it. Thus, you get to have all the other animals surrounding it benefit as well. It is not taken away from the environment. It's actually giving back. And it's more chemically and it's more chemically appropriate for the world at large. So you get to get better meat nutritionally. You get to get it at a better price. And you're doing something that's better for the earth. And you get to avoid and bypass the horrors of how most you know, it, affordable meat is is makes its way onto our plates. You know, so I, I don't want to sound like I'm giving a lecture. I just I was asked a question, and that's uh, that's my best answer. As far as like tips for barbecuing and stuff, I'm not. You know, I, I I'm good at it now, but I just I did it a lot. I never. I, I can't really give you any tips. I would say you know don't don't cook really cold meat. You don't want to take it right out of the fridge. And then, uh, and, and just throw it right on the grill. Let it get to room temperature, you know, 45 minutes of just being out on the counter. Um, that tends to make it a lot easier to cook and it will cook a little bit more uniformly. 
Don't overcook meat. If you like it well done, I don't know what to say. That's a bad choice. Um, and, you know, the Internet's a great thing. There's so many expert barbecue uh, chefs that will give you great advice. I'm just a guy who I, I feel like I've gotten very good at it just by doing it a lot. I certainly fucked a lot of meat up in the process, but uh, after 25 years of doing it four or five days a week, you just kind of naturally get a little bit better at it. So best swimmers are always in the pool, my man. Um, How long did it take Bianca to grow that ass? It's a tough question because my wife, Bianca, who has literal blogs about her ass. Um, you know, my wife's an actress and she was in a lot of uh, really well-watched sitcoms and movies so her ass was seen and my wife has quite the beautiful derriere and it's full and plump so i don't think i can narrow down how long it took her because she was born gifted in that department but i will say in the last like it took her about four to six weeks to really modify it but but training hard Four days a week. She was training hard four days a week, um, really diving into compound lifts and stuff with um, calculated linear progression. And after uh, really like four weeks, I was like, oh, wow. It became more tight and pronounced. Um, so that's that's my best way of explaining it. But I will say, I, I think like don't, don't kind of get disappointed if you can't see those types of gains in your own life if you're not a genetic, genetically gifted person. You know, Dr. Drew is the same way. Dr. Drew always had giant guns, big fucking biceps and striated triceps. So he starts lifting like two weeks later. You're like, oh, fuck, look at you. Look at you, Lou Ferrigno in his prime. Um, I, I always had broad shoulders. I'm a, not a big man, but I always had broad shoulders. And so as soon as I start if I take some layoff, I get back into the weight room. It's like immediately I see that. I wish I could say the same thing about my legs. So understand, you know, genetics are real. Uh, healthy snack recommendation. What's a cheat meal consist of for you from Kaiten Gunex? Healthy snack? I, I'm not a big believer in snacking be honest healthy snack is stomach acid eat a good meal before you go to work or when you get going in the morning if you don't like eating breakfast you want to intermittent fast fine push it later in the day then eat another solid serving you know protein dominant food four to five hours later and then do it again four to five hours after that uh if you're one of those people that must eat frequently i don't know i Certainly fruit and proteins are going to be great go-tos because they're easily, dige easily digested. They're good for you. And they're typically things that you can take on the go. I mean, it's easy to grab an orange or an apple, take it with you along with a protein shake or Greek yogurt or a cottage cheese. But besides that, I would say, like, work not to snack. I do think that there's some science to show that optimal serving size or, or frequency of eating is about five but I don't eat five meals I will eat three meals and then I have a pre-workout and post-workout snack I guess you know so it ends up being five kind of servings of protein there but I'm not a I don't I don't think that it gives the lion's share of people shouldn't be snacking and I think that's one of the reasons why we have an epidemic of obesity is that people have have brainwashed themselves to believe that they constantly are need like a serving of food. Um, women biologically do seem to do better eating a little bit more frequently. They're not taking as big of a gap between their their meals. So I get that. But you you really don't need to eat a lot or frequently. Again, if you're a, if you're a competitive athlete, I do think that there's been some pretty compelling science to show that 
eating four to five times a day, four to six times a day is beneficial compared to eating two to three times a day. But how many of us are competitive athletes? And reducing the frequency of how much you eat can a increase a lot of the beneficial hormones in your body and help you control hunger a little bit better and gives people a better chance to be consistent and adherent to um, a caloric deficit. So um, that's my best advice. I don't think that most people are under the impression that um, if they just eat more frequently, it'll keep them less hungry. Maybe, maybe that works for you. But many people find that by virtue of sitting down to eat, it actually increases their hunger. And that if they stretch it out, not only are they, uh, like I said, you're benefiting chemically a lot of times, but you're you also can start to develop a better control of hunger um, by doing it. And it's it's tough at first, but if you power through, it can be very, very beneficial. All right, that was a good show. As I mentioned before, I have slots available at my top tier on Patreon. Go to Patreon at uh, Mike Catherwood is all you need to search for. I will link to it below if you're watching this on YouTube. And I genuinely enjoy helping people. I don't I have much to offer, you know, I, I don't. <laughs> so if there, I, you know, I've kind of narrowed, I've narrowed down and I've zeroed in on something that I can be of use to lots of people. And it's like, man, it just gives me a buzz. I definitely like the financial aspect of it, but, but please believe, and I, I mean this sincerely, it, it, it brings me so much joy to, to help other people because I think there's just too much goddamn information out there. And a lot of it is not very useful. And I've, uh, I've made a lot of mistakes and I just would be so overjoyed if I could help prevent you from making those same mistakes. All right. In this crazy mixed up world that makes you think that nobody cares. I do love you. Bye.